Hello and welcome to College Physics 1, Lecture 9, Motion with Constant Acceleration. For uniform motion, that is, motion with a constant velocity, we found a simple relationship between position and time. But it is no surprise that there are also simple relationships that connect the various kinematic variables in constant acceleration motion as well. So what we're going to do in this lecture is introduce three really important equations that govern the motion of objects with constant acceleration. So we're going to introduce that, and then in our next lecture, we're going to simply solve a bunch of problems using them. So I tend to think that it's important to show you where certain equations come from, and so for most of this lecture, I'm going to be deriving these three main equations. So just bear with me, this isn't something usually that you're expected to do on your own unless you're on uh, a more advanced level, but still, I don't think it's as useful to just throw an equation on the screen and say, here it is, now use it to solve. So let's take a look at our first equation. Consider an object whose acceleration, ax, remains constant during the time interval delta t of its motion. At the beginning of this interval, the object has an initial velocity, vx initial, and an initial position, x initial. The object's velocity is changing because, well, it's accelerating. So let's start with the definition of acceleration once more. So we've already given this equation before. We know that by definition, acceleration is equal to a change in velocity over a change in time. In other words, it's the final velocity minus the initial velocity over delta t. Now notice um, I'm using parentheses here mainly just to separate the subscripts. Um, so it's the x velocity final. Um, it gets a little messy sometimes if you don't use the parentheses because it might start to look like weird subscripts. So we tend to use parentheses at least for our purposes. So our first equation out of the three that I've been mentioning is simply a rearrangement of this acceleration equation. So let's take this equation and solve it for vx final. To do this, you multiply delta t to the other side and then add vx initial to the other side. This gives you what we call the velocity equation, which says that the final velocity is equal to your initial velocity plus ax delta t. So what this does is it allows you to solve for a future velocity, right? You can kind of predict something down the road. So that is our first equation. Nothing too fancy here, nothing too complicated. Again, it's just a rearrangement of the acceleration equation. Well, now let's take a look at the position equation. So if you have an object moving with a constant um, acceleration, it will have a constantly increasing velocity graph, something like what we see on the right. So it should have a straight sloped line. We'll also remember that if you wanted to find a displacement from a velocity graph, right? So you have a velocity graph, you need to work backwards to get a position or a displacement. You need to find the area under that graph. So this is a little bit complicated. And again, this isn't something I would expect my own students to rep replicate, but recognize that if we're trying to find the displacement from some initial time ti to some final time tf, we need to find the area of this shaded region. Now, recognize that this is a trapezoidal shape, so um, we have to break this up into two common shapes that we can find the area of. So, um, we find the area of this rectangle and this area of the triangle and add them together. So let's try this um, piece by piece. So it tries to paint this picture a little bit. Um, so let's see, I don't know why my taskbar is showing up. Okay, let's use, let's say blue. Well, actually, sorry, uh, let me use the yellow one. I'll stick with that. So we need to find the area of this rectangle. Well, it's a rectangle, so it's length times width. And in this case, the length, let's say the height of this object is the initial velocity. So we have VX initial. 
and the uh, uh, width of the object is the time interval from t initial to t final, so it's delta t. So the area of the rectangle is vx initial times delta t. Now, to get the area of the triangle, we have to use 1 half base times height. So we'll end up with 1 half times the base, which we'll say is, again, the time interval delta t, times the height. Now notice, the height is technically vx initial to vx final, so it's your delta v. Now, delta v, if you use the acceleration equation, is equal to ax times delta t. So this is just the rearrangement of the acceleration equation, so times ax delta t. So the displacement is equal to the total area, so vx initial times delta t plus this 1 half ax times basically delta t squared. So let's put this into words. Again, find the total area, so you add those two pieces together, and now we can actually write down our big position equation. So we can solve for the final position of an object, it's equal to whatever the initial position is, plus the area under the curve that we just looked at. So that's just a quick glimpse at where this equation comes from. Um, again, I'm not expecting my own students to re redo this. Um, we're just going to use this equation now to solve actual world problems, but I still think it's at least important to see roughly where it comes from. So that's our position equation. Well, I said there were three, so there's still one more equation that we need to take a look at. This is also a velocity equation, but I call it the time-independent equation uh, for a good reason. Now, to solve for this equation, it's a little bit more complicated. So what we're going to do is take the first equation, the velocity equation, which said that vx final was equal to vx initial plus ax delta t, and we're going to rearrange that to solve for delta t. So the first equation we solve for, rearrange it for delta t to get this statement. Then we're going to take this big equation here for delta t and plug it into this position equation. So we're going to take that delta t and plug it in to here. And then I skip over this part, but we simplify and solve for vx final. So you combine those two past equations to get this new third equation, which states that the uh, final velocity squared is equal to the initial velocity squared plus 2 times the acceleration and the displacement delta x. Now you might be asking, well, why would we bother with this third equation if it's simply a combination of the first two? Well, again, it's in the name. Notice that this does not require us to know the time interval delta t. It doesn't show up in this equation. So any time that we're solving a problem that doesn't have time in it, it's a good indication that we'll probably have to use this equation since time is not necessary. Okay. So up until this point in our lecturing, we've mostly really just discussed horizontal motion. But of course, motion can also be in the vertical direction, and so we're going to slightly introduce that here. Oh, um, oh, I forgot that I put this here. So this is just a summary of all of the statements we've made so far. Uh, so here you can see our three main equations along the bottom, some of the older equations for velocity and acceleration up top. So this is kind of just a one-stop uh, resource for you for all of the equations we have discussed up until this point. So let's now take a look at some of this vertical motion. So we're going to consider a very specific case of vertical motion known as freefall. If an object happens to move under the influence of gravity only, in other words, no other forces, we call the resulting motion freefall. So this is really important. So we're saying it's only under the influence of gravity, no other forces. So what that means is if you have an object falling through the air or thrown through the air, we can't have anything else acting on it, which means we need to ignore things like air resistance or drag. Um, and we do that in our material. So we, then, we do tend to ignore air resistance. So if you have an object in free fall, 
no matter what the object is or how massive that object is, if it's in free fall, it will have the exact same acceleration, no matter what. So it doesn't matter if it's a feather versus an elephant falling, if it's truly in free fall, they will have the same acceleration. In other words, they fall at the same rate. And they will hit the ground at the exact same time. So if you drop a hammer and a feather, well, if you do that in the real world, of course you'll know what will happen. The hammer will quickly strike the ground, but the feather will kind of slowly drift downward and land sometime later. But if you happen to do this experiment on the moon, where there is no atmosphere, so no air, the result is strikingly different. Both the hammer and the feather experience the exact same acceleration, undergo the same motion, and strike the ground at the same time. Apollo 15 lunar astronaut David Scott performed this exact experiment on the moon. Because the moon lacks an atmosphere, objects fall to the surface with no air resistance, and so they're only acted upon by gravity, and that's what you're seeing in this animated GIF on the right-hand side. You're seeing that experiment of the hammer and the feather falling together. Now, uh, at this point, I also have a really cool video I would uh, hope that you'll take a moment to watch. I'll link this in the YouTube description for easier access. Um, but in this video, you're actually going to see this experiment done on Earth. But it's done in a giant vacuum chamber where the air is pumped out, and then they drop a bowling ball next to a feather. So you get to see it in better quality than the moon experiment. Okay, so let's analyze this motion in a little bit more detail. So again, we're going to focus only on situations where air resistance is ignored. In other words, anything that's in motion through the air is in free fall. So one thing to note is that free fall acceleration in other words, the acceleration due to gravity always, always points downward, no matter what direction the object is moving. And so this can be a confusing uh, point for some students because, um, I mean, it makes sense if your object is falling straight down, as in the image on the left, while well, you're moving downward and you're picking up speed, so your acceleration points in the same direction as your motion, in other words, downward. But, even if you're moving upward, like in the case on the right, you'll see that you're moving upward, but slowing down. Because you're slowing down, as we learned in our last lecture, acceleration will point in the opposite direction to your motion, so it also points downward. So in either case, we have an acceleration that points downward, in the negative direction. And here on Earth, the value of this acceleration is pretty much the same everywhere. So we consider the free fall acceleration in the vertical direction to be negative, because it's downward, 9.8 meters per second squared, always. And so if you were to make a graph of the velocity over time, you would see it constantly decrease at 9.8 meters per second for every second of time. All right. So, uh, let's conclude this lecture with just a few questions. And these ones are tricky, so be careful. Question number one. A ball is tossed straight up in the air, and it is at its very highest point. At that highest point, what is its acceleration? Okay, so tossing a ball upward at the highest point, what is the acceleration of the ball? Okay. So, this one is a little tricky. A lot of students tend to say zero. The ball actually does come to a stop momentarily at the top of its motion. So, the velocity is zero, but the acceleration is not. Remember, acceleration, by definition, is a change in velocity. But remember, velocity is both a size, in other words, how fast, and a direction. So if either of those two things changes, you are accelerating by definition. So even though we have zero velocity at the highest point of our motion, at that point, we are changing our direction from being upward to downward. And so by definition, we are still accelerating, and it's that acceleration of negative 9.8 meters per second squared. The acceleration, as we said, is always downward. 
And so that's still kind of hard for students to visualize. So the way I personally think about it is just ask yourself, does gravity happen to suddenly turn off for that split second where it's at the top of its motion? Well, certainly not, right? Acceleration is still there to act and pull on the object. So the acceleration is always negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So our answer here is B. All right, question two. An arrow is launched vertically upward. It moves straight up to a maximum height, then falls back to the ground. The trajectory of the arrow is noted in the image on the bottom left. At which point of the trajectory is the arrow's acceleration the greatest, and where is it the least? So in this case, keep in mind what we just talked about. At every single point, gravity is acting in the same way. So this is actually a trick question. The acceleration is the same at all points A, B, C, D, and E. It is always a negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Always. All right, let's do our last question. Question three. An arrow is launched vertically upward again. It moves straight up to a maximum height and then falls back to the ground. The trajectory of the arrow is noted on the far left. So same concept as the last question, but this time it wants you to figure out what the velocity graph of its motion would look like. So take a second to think about what that would look like. Okay. So let's split this up into parts. In the first half of its motion, it's moving upward. And so as it's moving upward, we should see two things about its velocity. First of all, it's moving upward against gravity. So it's going to be slowing down. Furthermore, it's pointed upward, so that is the positive direction. So we should have a positive velocity that is decreasing for this first segment. Well, A, B, C, and D all show a positive decreasing velocity, but E shows a positive increasing velocity in the beginning. And so we don't see it picking up speed. It should be slowing down. E can be ruled out. At the very top of its motion, for a split second, it comes to a stop. In other words, the velocity is zero. Well, technically, in the middle, all of these have zero, but one of these can really be ruled out, and that's B. Because what B is showing us is an object that stops and just hovers there in place for some amount of time before then deciding to fall back down. That, of course, is ridiculous. You can't have an object just hovering in place, so we can rule out B. Now, for the last half of the motion, we see the object moving back downward. It's moving downward, which is the negative direction. So we should have a negative velocity. That rules out option A, which shows a positive velocity. So we're left with either C or D. Both of these show positive than negative velocity and decreasing and increasing. So what's the correct option here? Well, remember, the acceleration is a constant 9.8 meters per second squared in the negative direction. So we should see a constant negative slope? The answer is D. We should see a constant negative slope because it is a constant negative acceleration. Okay, we now have the framework established for us to move on to actually solving big real-world problems. We're going to use those three equations and this type of motion to analyze a bunch of different situations in our next lecture. So until then, take care and have a great day.